Good morning, friends. It is again a pleasure to be with you. I am giggling because on the back end, what you don't see is a bunch of us just doing the work, doing our best to pull this all together. And it is a joy to work with our tech team and our entire pastoral staff team. Um, I'm just really grateful for them. So just going to call them out right now and just say all that make worship possible in our space. Uh, I am really grateful for you and for all of the work that you do. Um, so people, we are people who love origin stories and I am no exception. I have preached on Marvel and other superheroes and, uh, and origin stories. And so you know that that is part of something that uh, in my biblical studies, I really hold on to and love. And one of my favorite things to do when I meet a new person is to ask them to tell me about themselves. Now, when I meet someone, I always have some preconceived notion about them. Uh, those notions are usually formed by how this meeting came to be. If a stranger reaches out to me as a pastor, I can deduce that there is something rumbling around in their life that is making them turn to God's community. Meaning I don't have to work against an embedded disbelief of theirs that God isn't at work in them. I just need to listen to how they describe it and we'll both know that God is present. But without fail, every time someone shares their life story, I always learn something new because the stories that are told about us are not always the stories that we would tell or as we would tell them. For example, if I shared with you that 2020 was the year that I watched more TV than any other year, including the near decade that I worked in TV and film, your preconceived notion may be that I have more downtime this year or that I am in a season of laziness. When in actuality, it's because the state of the world is so traumatic that I am not sleeping as much, or that some of the time that I have previously spent devoted to the news is now spent in reruns of Insecure, and The West Wing, or The Magicians. It also doesn't tell you that I've been really intentional about my physical self-care uh, and now, and so every morning I get up and uh, run on my treadmill and watch an episode or two of TV. The Magicians is a show that I have recently gotten into. It is my treadmill show of the moment. And don't worry, this is a no spoiler sermon. But as I was preparing this week's sermon, one of the episodes I watched uh, while running had a particularly pertinent opening for who we are and what we are doing in this time together. In the magical world of the magicians, everyone's life book is held in a library in another realm. And one of the librarians asks an apprentice librarian why he shelved certain books the way he did. The apprentice answered that he shelved these books, these lives, in a secondary character section of the library because when he read the books, he didn't see them to be the main character. The questioning librarian said that this was wrong and that the reason the apprentice librarian shelved it this way was because the person he thought of as the main character looked more like him and the other characters did not. It reminded me that the way we interpret the stories of others has a lot to do with how we situate ourselves in the narrative. And that the narratives that are at work are not always the narratives of truth which is something that our scripture today points us towards. For most Christians, what we know of the book of Exodus is that it's the story of Moses and the Israelites seeking liberation and freedom. But this week, I had a really wonderful conversation with Rabbi Ethan at uh, Park Avenue Synagogue. And when I asked him what this book was about in his opinion, he said that it was about care. Because as he sees it, that's the main theme in the five books of the Torah. And now care and liberation are not terms that negate each other. On the contrary, care and liberation are intrinsically linked. But who is telling the story matters. And that is tied to how we see ourselves in the story as the reader. I will admit that this week as I was reading our text our ex from Exodus over and over, the first character that stuck, uh, stood out to me was the unnamed Pharaoh. 
The ways in which he was not only oppressive, but ultimately genocidal rang true for me as a parallel narrative I see at work in our world today. Now I have a lot of privilege as a straight white woman, but I, have no, I had no trouble seeing today's empire and ru rulers in this story of Pharaoh. But after my conversation with Rabbi Ethan, I reread this text as an origin story of care. If Genesis is a call to care for all of God's creation, then Exodus was a call to care for people specifically, which like this apprentice librarian, refocused my understanding of who the primary characters are in these stories. And when I opened myself up and stepped away from my preconceived notions, the origin story became clear for the true heroes in this part of the story, the midwives. When Exodus was written after the Babylonian exile, midwifery was women's work. And while the majority of modern midwives also identify as female today, I don't want to exclude the work of our male, non-binary and gender expansive midwives. But for the sake of our time together this morning, I will refer to them collectively as women. Anyway, when I look at the call to care found in this book and specifically in this chapter, the midwives are the catalyst of courage and care that we are called to follow. Shifra and Pua are the names given of the two midwives, and we are to understand them as the head midwives of this midwifery union at work. They are the ones that Pharaoh gives orders to uh, and that are expected to disseminate that, imp uh, that information and impose this new order. They are the ones that Pharaoh has ordered to see his vision through and would probably be the first two held accountable should things go awry. Even though Pharaoh's vision goes against the midwife's own best interest and the best interest of the Israelites. But we can't say that we don't understand that. Collectively, white women have historically voted against their own self-interest and the interests of all women. So this is not only new or a new concept, but governing powers have always counted on women to put more faith in patriarchal structures rather than self-care and care of the female community. And why is that? Why, are we put, why do we put such emphasis there? Why are we as women such a special demographic? In short, it's because we control what is birthed into the world, what is new. And friends, regardless of your gender or ability, you are a part of this process that is birthing something new right now. Or as the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney puts it, we are the ones who deliver the deliverer. Friends, we are the ones who deliver the deliverer. We are the midwives of today's story. The midwives in today's story are charged by, by governing forces to dictate what is allowed to birth anew into this world. Pharaoh calls for the demise of boys and to let girls live because the women seem like less of a threat. The midwives and their women will surely listen to him. After all, they have been subjugated and overlooked for so long, they clearly must align with the forces that govern. Why would a housewife, a mother, a midwife, or an auntie go against the system that lifts up their men? But the reigning influencers that be have overlooked the power of the sisterhood, the deeply rooted and interconnectedness that is female relationships, which is why when one group of women betrays the sisterhood, more than connection and respect is destroyed. But when someone comes for the women, comes to hurt, oppress, or keep the sisters down, watch out. Because women together can move mountains, make miracles, and bring about a new vision of leadership. And when that power is also a part of a wider community, like this community of faith, nothing is impossible. This text gives us a template to go against the systems of oppression we are expected to buy into and reminds us that our commitment to each other, our communities, our cultures are more holy than the commitments to a single ruler. And this scares those in power. In her book, Woman is Midrash, Dr. Gaffney states that 
Quote, the story of Exodus provides a template for American expansion into the West, the subjugation of American native peoples, and for the self-liberation of enslaved African peoples in the Americas. Its liberating paradigm supplies rhetoric and imagery for the LGBTQIA community coming out of spaces in which human dignity has been eclipsed. So friends, we have the template. And with the past and present use of Exodus in our context, we can see how we as modern readers and hearers are called to act in the best interest of each other. After all, Shifra and Pua could not have been uh, could not have been executed and or could, sorry could have been executed and the Israelite women overtly destroyed for going against Pharaoh. Let me say that again: the Shifra and Pua, the two lead midwives, could have been executed and overwhelmingly the Israelite women could have been destroyed just overtly for going against the ruling. But most tyrannical leaders do not actually like to get their hands dirty. It looks better for the empire if the groups pushing back against the governing systems destroy themselves rather than at the behest of the government. This is historically where false narratives come from and where fear dwells. But it is not true when you stop and listen to the stories of the people as they tell you about their own lives. The stories of everyday peoples, past, present, and future. Their lived experiences and their dreams for their future rarely align with the narrative of the homogenous ruling class. Which is why it is important to listen to not only the intent of one story, but the words and the characters they use to tell their own story. You may have heard, and it is no secret to most people, you may have heard that women don't like each other. But if you listen to the stories of women, our stories are ripe with love and connection and support and intimacy, both physical and emotional. And I'm not equating uh, physical intimacy solely with sexual intimacy, though there is that too. But what I'm talking about is something much deeper. When those stories are shared, new energies, new narratives, new life is present in the world. What we have been told and what is faithfully true do not always align. And it is our job, our collective job, to fix the narrative by telling our stories. In our scripture, at first glance, we care that the midwives were the catalyst, if not the direct hands that saved Moses. But when we step back and hear and value the full story, we see that Shifra and Pua and the midwives saved us as well. And now this story is not just one for women. Creation is about to birth, all of creation is about to birth a new way of life into being. And all people, men, women, non-binary, gender expansive people alike are expected and needed to bring it into this world. We are all the midwives of this new era. All of us. We are all the midwives of this new era. An era that includes care for each other, care for the climate, care for, care for spaces of equitable justice under the law, care for global citizenry. And participation in democracy is how each of us catch that newly born and love it into existence. So friends, who are the midwives in your life? Who are you a midwife to? What are we collectively hoping to birth? Who has helped guide you into the person you want to be and the community member you hope to become? Who in our scriptures have you overlooked that God has placed right in front of you to remind you of where you have been and where we are all going? And finally, when future generations read the story of your life, what part do you hope gets written down, remembered, so and told so that you are always shelved back in the section of the library for authentic and God-fearing heroes? You are writing that story right now. What will this next chapter of yours be? 
only you and God can decide. Amen.